everyone, I'm Charna Davis Weesey, and welcome to UCF in Print. So, when Anne Rice stopped writing vampire books, fans of the genre were crushed. But don't worry, the reviews are in, and a UCF professor has more than filled the void with a tale that is scary and cool and really, really different. Join me in welcoming Susan Hubbard. Now, Susan, as we can see from this pile here, and the, the fact that you kind of need a whole bookshelf for your books, this is not your first. Not my first. But it is definitely the one that has totally hit not only nationwide, but I've read reviews from outside of this country as well. Well, it's still uh, being sold. The foreign rights are still in process. The British edition will be out next year. And uh, Italy and France also are going to have um, editions of it. So, yeah. It's oh, my gosh. How cool is that? It's to be nice. an author and they're translating it into Italian and French. <laughs> that is very good. Now, the book is called, this latest one is called The Society of S. Why don't we pick it up and show the cover is almost as neat as the website, which is spooky and fun and interesting. And you had a big hand in the website for the book, didn't you? I provided the content, but the designer is a woman in Boston I've never met. Oh, Simon and Schuster hired her, and, and they uh, paid for it to go up, and it's, it is a nice site, yeah. Now, in the interest of time, when I first introduced you, I called it a vampire story, but it really isn't. The vampires are almost um, part of the background of it. You wouldn't really like to call it a vampire story. Would you? I don't think it's a genre book. Mm -hmm. uh, and from most of the reviews I've had, they, you know, critics don't think so either, which is a relief. Because uh, genre books, you think of characters who are kind of stereotypical and flat. And you think of vampires with fangs and, you know, no ethics. All and evil. All evil, all the bad guys. But this book sort of considers what would happen if the vampires were the good guys, some of them. And the um, instance of them being vampires isn't really terribly central to the book itself. It's a literary book. It's more driven by characters than it is by... Personalities. Yeah. To, 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 to back it up, it's about a 12, 13-year-old girl. Yes. Aria, Ariella Montero. Yes. And she is being raised by her father, who is a scientist. Yes. Her mother has disappeared. Yes. And as she gets older, she's homeschooled, and she realizes because of people who come into her life, there's more of the world. Is that right, right set up? Very good. Yeah, good summary. <laughs> good summary. So that's when everything starts to change for her, and probably at the time when things change for all of us. 12 or 13 years old, you're venturing out from your family for the first time. You're seeking approval elsewhere than mom and dad, and she wants to know what happened to her mother, what the rest of the world is about. And she goes on the road to find out. She's read Kerouac's On the Road, and that's one of her inspirations. But she does more than most of us do in trying to put our family's puzzle pieces together. She, she literally goes out and travels from Saratoga Springs, New York, to Savannah, uh, and then into Florida, to Homosassa Springs, Sarasota. She brushes through Winter Park in passing. Kind of, it's not, kind of like your journey <laughs> from upstate A little New York bit. down here. Yeah. So she thinks of her father as a scientist, right. a vegetarian environmentalist. And someone who suffers from lupus. Oh. She thinks. She thinks mm -hmm. because of, of the way he looks and, 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 the way, and the way he lives. And his sensitivity to sunlight, the fact that when he does go out, he tends to wear lots of uh, layers. Um, so in your book, the vampires can go out in the daytime oh, yeah. because they protect themselves. Sunscreen or sunblock. So she actually finds the rest of the world by uh, a housekeeper that brings her the life. She, she goes on the internet and realizes there's so much more to life than what she's been. Yeah, and she has a friend who introduces her to television. Uh, she's been brought up without TV, if you can imagine such a thing. And uh, she's been brought up with books and, and with uh, conversation, but not, not TV. So she learns through TV a lot about popular culture that she otherwise wouldn't have come into contact with. So when she asks her father about her mother, he basically tells the beginning of the love story to her. Yeah. That's the part of the book that came first to me. It was a, a dream about a man and a woman meeting in Savannah. And when I woke up from the dream, the voice of the character was very strong in my head, so I wrote it down. Uh, and within a couple of days, uh, I read it aloud to my family and to my uh, agent, Marcy Posner, in New York, and she said, I think you're onto something. And the rest of the book, I don't want to say it was easy, but it came, it grew out of that dream almost organically. It was not like any of the other books I've written. It really, it, it flowed in a way that um, pleased me. You know, I've, I've read um, interviews in, uh, with J.K. Rowling, who, who said the same thing about the Harry Potter books. That yeah. She had all these, these outlines of the characters and what happened, and it just came out of her without really 
uh, without suffering over it. Yeah. That it was just a story waiting to come out. I think the creative process is very mysterious. Um, but I think with Rowling, with Alice Hoffman, um, so many writers, dreams really do speak to them and to me. And then um, once you, got, you pay attention to your dreams, and you begin putting together all the possibilities. You know, what if character A went here or there? It's, it's awfully fun. And I think also people who are really success, successful in creative careers, they don't really, they, they feel the fear and do it anyway. It's not, you don't think, oh, was somebody going to like this? This just comes out, I'm going to do it, I'm going to be bold. Yeah. And, you take and your that's risks. what works. You have to take risks. I tell my students at UCF, if you're not prepared to make an ass of yourself every day of your life, you shouldn't be a writer. <laughs> You know, and you that's what do. you do also. You teach this. You teach people how to be. How to be writers. yeses. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think uh, most of us can figure that out on our own. But um, uh, how to be writers at, in the master's program at UCF. And the undergrad and master's program, yes. We have an MFA program in creative writing, and, uh, and that's uh, a great source of pride to me and, and pleasure. I love working with students. It helps me see my own work in new ways. And uh, writing workshops are... Uh, the best way I know to learn how to hear your own voices and make them stronger. When uh, does Ariella figure out that her father's a vampire? He tells her, finally, but I'm giving away too much. <laughs> I oh, want no. it to be suspenseful. People are still going to want to read it. Uh, and wh but what's interesting is how you mentioned the vampires is not necessarily the bad guys. They're, they're so complex and intellectual and the 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 many sides of them that you gave them is really very interesting. Thank you. Well, I enjoyed playing with places that I've been to in the world. I've, I've lived in, briefly in Cambridge, England. I've lived in um, Florida, obviously. I've lived briefly, I stayed at an uh, artist colony in Saratoga Springs called Yaddo. So I've been to the places and the landscapes uh, are very important to me when I write. They have become, I should say. They weren't always. When I first started writing, I don't think I cared that much. But now as I'm getting older, I notice things. I notice details of setting and the way landscapes affect people's characters and personalities. And you know, well, that's a lot of the reviews that people love about your writing. What I've loved, for the, the, what I've read, is that the, the attention to detail, it really draws, as a reader, it really draws you in and you don't, you feel like you're there. It's so real because of that. Thank you. And does that, do you have to go back and do that or does that just come as you're writing, does, does the detail come out? I actually went back in this book to Savannah and took a camera, revisited locations. It was like scouting locations for TV or the movies in a way. I took photos, some of which are now on the website for the book or the MySpace page for the book, uh, and let the houses and the landscape speak to me and influence the way I plotted the story. We'll talk more in a, about a minute. We'll be right back. back we're talking to Susan Hubbard about her latest book and greatest success called The Society of S and it is a story with vampires in it but it's a story about self-awareness coming the quote-unquote coming of age <laughs> interaction between people the search for who you are all of that and a real treat you're going to read a little bit yes. for us I thought the part I'd read is the preface to the book which is the part that came out of the dream I was talking about a moment ago on a cool spring night in Savannah, my mother is walking. Her clogs make sounds like horse's hooves against the cobblestone street. She passes among banks of azaleas in full bloom and live oak trees shrouded in Spanish moss, and she enters a green square bordered by a cafe. My father is seated on a stool at a wrought iron table. Two chessboards spread across the table, and my father has castled on one when he looks up, sees my mother, and drops a pawn which falls against the tabletop and rolls onto the sidewalk. My mother dips to pick up the chess piece and hands it back to him. 
She looks from him to the two other men sitting at the table. Their faces are expressionless. They're all tall and thin, but my father has dark green eyes that somehow seem familiar. My father stretches out a hand and cups her chin. He looks into her pale blue eyes. I know you, he says. With his other hand, he traces the shape of her face, passing twice over the widow's peak. Her hair is long and thick, russet brown, with small wisps that he tries to smooth away from her forehead. The other men at the table fold their arms, waiting. My father has been playing both of them simultaneously. She stares at my father's face, dark hair falling away from his forehead, straight dark eyebrows over those green eyes, lips thin but shaped in a cupid's bow. Her smile is shy, frightened. He drops his hands, slides off the stool, and they walk away together. The men at the table sigh and clear the chessboards. Now they'll have to play each other. And it goes on from there to the mother and father who aren't um, acquainted at that time, so we think, uh, becoming a couple almost immediately. When Arielle hears the story, she's uh, struck by how that can happen. And one of the themes of the book is discovering first how one's parents ever got together, which is something I think many of us wonder about. How does that happen? We're not there, and yet we are. Mm -hmm. And then also, what is the nature of love, and how does it inform your early years and the years beyond? So uh, there's some serious themes in the book. Um, another one is also being an other, being an outsider. And I've discovered that all my writing deals with that to some extent. Because I even though the vampire really is, we all sometimes, at least in points of our lives, feel like we are. Oh, sure. It's something everybody can really relate to. Yeah. And I bet this would be a, a, a real perplexing thought and story for Ariella because here is this wonderful tale, this very gentle, tender tale, yet she never knew them together. She never knew them together. And uh, part of what the, uh, the sequel is the book I'm working on now, uh, she never quite can get them together. They kind of keep moving. And uh, I think a lot of children who grow up without one parent around have that fantasy of, you know, just once getting them together and everything will be perfect. But it doesn't seem to work that way outside of certain Hollywood films. I bet part of the vampire uh, I keep coming back to it because it is so interesting. Mm -hmm. the, the vampire existence and being an author and writing about them is the fact that they live forever yeah. and they are undead. They look at the world in a different way than the rest of us. Yes. The, hence the environmentalism. Yes. <laughs> they, they really are invested in what the place is going to be like in a couple hundred years because they'll be here. I was saying they'll have a stake in it, but that's not a good <laughs> pun. But, but yeah, I mean, um, if you were going to live forever, think about how you might live differently. I've thought about it. Uh, I think we'd, we'd pay more attention to the way we treat our neighbors. We'd certainly pay more attention to the long-term consequences of our actions and of the policies that we live with unthinkingly every day. We live more green, as, if you will, than we do. Um, and uh, be, if you didn't have to be afraid of dying, I think you'd be willing to take more risks. How, how shocked were you? Because you, you have been an author, published author, of wonderful works. How shocked were you when this hit so big? With Shocked. so many reviews, because I know maybe maybe it's the word I use when I, I used to do big documentaries and things, and even when I thought it was really good work for me, to me it was like, oh my gosh, they like it. Yeah, well, there's a little you know bit of I mean? Sally Field in all of us, isn't it? <laughs> you yeah. like me, oh. you really like me. When I went out to Portland for the American Booksellers Association conference last uh, January, Simon and Schuster took me and one other author. And I had no idea what to expect. This is a seminar that draws together independent bookstore owners from all across the country. Um, they had mailed those people advanced copies of the book. And I was sort of ushered into this room where we heard the publisher's representatives pitching our books. And all the authors in the room were cringing. <laughs> so even if we like our book, we hear it puffed that way. It was kind of embarrassing. <sighs> but then they, they led us to this table, and they plied us with wine. <laughs> And uh, all, I couldn't believe the lines of booksellers. And one of um, the uh, first one who asked me to sign his book was 
from San Diego, and he stood next to my uh, table and sort of gave people a, um, a spiel about how wonderful the book was. So yeah, it was, it was embarrassing <laughs> and wonderful. <laughs> Oh, wonderful. I sold, I, I signed 150 of those. And that's one reason I was invited to do the tour, because many of those owners invited me to come and read in their stores. So it was, it's been amazing. Yeah. Whenever I've met authors, the first tour, they always say is the most difficult. Because, you know, when, when you're a writer, you know, I'm definitely not a writer to the extent that you are, but in the broadcast things I've written, and even though my job is in front of the camera, is still you have a little bit of that introvert in you. Oh, sure. That when you s actually see the people, and it is almost like not really an embarrassment; it's uncomfortable. You don't know how to how to actually uh, resolve it with being alone with the keyboard, putting it out. Yeah, yeah. It's such an uh, entirely parallel universe almost. Well, this is a lot more fun <laughs> than yeah. sitting alone in a room with a keyboard. On that, that has its pleasures too. But I think it's 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 a lot of fun to go out in the world and meet people, um, so many different kinds of people who have read your words and interpreted them in all manner of ways. Uh, there was a girl I met in San Diego who said that reading this book changed her life. That she wants to be like my protagonist, Ariella. She wants to be a better student. She wants to be as intellectual. And she hadn't really thought about that until she read the book. That amazed me. I got an email from a librarian in Pennsylvania just last week who said that because of this book in the library, the young readers are reading other books because this book references Edgar Allan Poe, Bertrand Russell, uh, Keats, Yeats, a number of, of T.S. Eliot uh, writers. And she said that, you know, people are asking where they can find out more about Poe and Eliot and Yeats. And I think as an English teacher, that's just thrilling. Where do you find your influences? Is it from Poe and Yeats and Eliot? Is that? Oh, sure, to yeah. some extent. I liked very much the strange tale of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which I think succeeds as a literary work and also as a kind of thriller, creepy book. And I thought that would be a fun thing to try on. I was also influenced by reading a book by Somerset Maugham called uh, The Magician, which I think is out of print. And it's a very, um, it's got a wonderful atmosphere to the style. So I, I thought, you know, that would be fun to play with. And um, not so much any contemporary vampire books. I have not read most of them. I read um, a little bit of Anne Rice years ago. This is nothing like that. Thank really. you. Really, it really, it really isn't. It's just, it's just the, the the vampire part of your book opens up a world of possibilities in terms of the human nature and human spirit. I think more than that, it, it, the vampires themselves, to me, from what I've read of the book shows more of our lives and what we could be and how we could be conflicted and the, the Jekyll and Hyde and all, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, of all of I us. love it. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> it's as if the vampire is a kind of metaphor and, um, and when you use a fantastic creature as a metaphor, it helps you, at least it did with this book, reach an audience that um, wouldn't have read it otherwise. In other words, when I've written some of my other books, I have sold maybe 2,000 copies you know, little books of short stories, my thin volumes of prose, I call them. <laughs> um, but these books, this book, has reached out to an audience way beyond that. And I think that's important. I think that literacy is critically important to the culture we're part of. And that writing just for our narrow group of scholars, say, or, or fellow academics or literary types isn't enough for me. You know, I wanted to get ideas out in, in a way that would actually uh, affect you know young people especially and also uh, young people of all ages and that sense of the magical and enchantment draws them in yeah well I I love Rowling personally and I think she's a, a magician with very words. into detail as well very into detail but very into character mm -hmm. I, and uh, and a good writer a seriously good writer I do not consider her work genre work uh, yeah. I'm very sorry that it, whatever's going to happen to Harry is going to happen I know. <laughs> Maybe it won't. <laughs> I know. And you know, it's funny. Uh, I remember a mother saying to me, you let your child read that? And I said, well, I want to kind of read it along with them. And anything that got my kids to pick up a book that's this thick mm -hmm. and not want to put it down was something really wonderful. And it wasn't about SpongeBob. <laughs> no. <laughs> but um, it, that, that was what you said. It, it opens up the literary world to more people. And it opens up a whole kind of critical thinking that doesn't, I don't think, take place when you watch television, say, or go to the movies. I think the engagement of the word with the eye is very important to thinking about 
yourself, about your place in the world, about what the world is doing, and about ultimately how you can take part. I think what's also interesting about the Society of S, it's almost like a memoir. You know, isn't it? It's in, it's in her. It's 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 her vision of it. Yeah, it's like a diary. Yeah. Um, I, when you said memoir, I was thinking it's not mine. Not yours. <laughs> uh, Ariella's memoir. But yeah. Yeah. In the first person, and she's telling you the story, and you it really draws you to her. I was not sure when I first started the book if I was going to keep it in her voice. And there are points where her father tells part of the story, mm -hmm. but her voice is strong to me. And when I finished the book, I found the voice was still with me. Because when, when I work on a novel, the characters are always in my head. I mean, I, I write for maybe four hours in the morning, but then the rest of the day, I'm still in kind of dialogue with the characters. And uh, so when I finished the manuscript, Ariella's voice was so strong, I felt almost a kind of postpartum depression. And I didn't want to say goodbye to her. And then when I signed on to do a sequel, I was like, both delighted and sort of intimidated by the More prospect. More than one of the reviews was hoping that it would become a series. Well, we'll see. Would that, would that be something you'd like? I don't know if I'd want a series. I know that I've got at least one more and possibly two more books to deal with the issues that I created. And one of the funny things that readers have pointed out to me is how many issues weren't fully resolved in the first book. And I did not plan that. I did not say, well, I'm going to be cagey. Well, that's life, though. That's life. <laughs> Exactly, and it's not all wrapped up in a neat package at the end of a year, say. Right. So we'll see how many years I have. With Is it going to be, I know that one of the things that Rowling did interesting, interestingly that other people didn't is that the characters aged oh, in, yes. each, in each sequel. Up to a point, because vampires uh, with, that, with the exception of the vampires, <laughs> but yeah. Ariella, Ariella is only part vampire, so does she age, or is that too much of a secret to ask I about? I think I shouldn't <laughs> answer that okay. on the I grounds it might incriminate her, yes. So the, the, you've already started it. Yes. A year is what you say. You've got a year to, to finish it, right? I've got a deadline of November 1st. Okay, a yeah. year till it's on the, until uh, we can, Next we can June. read it. Next June, yeah. Till we can read it. Yeah. That seems daunting to me. It seems till November doesn't seem like a, you know, a, a certain amount of months to finish it. Seems daunting, but it's probably going to flow right out. Well, it's daunting when you stop and think about it in terms of, oh my God, it has to be done in November. But if you think that every day you get to spend time with characters you really enjoy writing about, and it's three or four hours out of your day. That's not really a big deal. The book is called The Society of S. And as usual, we, we're out of time, but it's really such wonderful success. I'm so happy for you. And then Two. when you finish this, you've got all of these that you can <laughs> go and read as well. Susan Hubbard, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm Charna Weesey. We'll see you next time on UCF in Print.